Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to another edition of Voices of Genius, the dawn of a new earth. I'm excited to be here with you today and our guest, Lee J. McClowski. There is so much going on as we emerge into this next, well, let's just say trajectory of our collective evolutionary cycle moving through that Piscean age and into this new age of Aquarius and all that that entails. And whether you can define that or feel it or understand that in your own way is perhaps less relevant to what does that mean to you right now? How can you engage these extraordinary times in a productive, healthy manner where we can help one another? serve the Pachimama, the planet. And today, I'm excited to begin our discussions. And I say that because we're going to have a series of discussions here with Lee about all of this and more, and really explore the power of the imaginative and why the, well, let's just say the human, our ability to dream, as the shamans say, to dream our world into being, to reimagine our sense of how we will engage and be in a deeper relationship with each other and the planet. We get to explore these things today, and we get to do so with none other than Lee, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for so, so many years. Welcome, Lee. Thank you, Adam, <laughs> and good to see you after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, after all these yes. years. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does go uh, by quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they certainly do. Well, let me share with each of you a little bit about Lee J. McClowski. Lee is a, an artist, an author, an actor, and a visual philosopher, amongst other things. And his highly creative life has been devoted to exploring the symbolic, the archetypal, and the hidden aspects of the psyche and inner self through his art, scholarship, books, and experiences as a convener of the conversation, this wonderful conversation about our humanity. And as an actor, and as a husband and father and grandfather, I've come to know Lee as well, a brother, a dear friend, a real comrade in our own collective destiny. And Lee lectures both internationally and internationally and has given numerous talks and presentations on the art and significance of visual philosophy. He has written illustrated, published several books, including his masterpiece of art and writing, The Tarot Revisioned, reviewed possibly as the most significant contribution to the tradition in over a hundred years. And we'll let Lee share a little bit more about how this all began for him in a moment. But I do want to say that there was a point that struck so many of us in more ways than one on 9-11-2001. And this is when it really began to emerge from his home studio, which he calls the hieroglyph of the human soul. And without further ado, Lee, it's great to be here with you. And before we get started in some of some nice video pieces that will share the hieroglyph and where we can journey with you into the depth of your work, into the depth of your genius, could you please share with us a little bit about, you know, who, who exactly are you? And <laughs> what is that sense of your own soul's work in the world or wherever that wants to take you? Because for some time, I've been fascinated and curious about what is emerging in and through you and the 
imperative now for your work to fully express itself. So it'd be great to, to know a little more. Please share with us. You know, Adam, one of the, the gifts that comes from uh, years passing quickly is that there is the ability to look back and sort of see more of the mosaic of one's life and the missing pieces or the things we can't put together as we're moving through them. But as we look back, we realize, oh, this was a much more interesting play than anything I could have known beforehand. And I, I, I joked, but it's rather true about how I feel. I feel like a man who spent most of his life walking backward into a room, meaning that it's not the forward motion of things, but actually this as as I've moved through life and as I've followed questions, um, it developed, uh, and no one's actually more surprised than I am, uh, this double life, this life as an artist, this life as a, what became a visual philosopher. And I was very fortunate because I grew up, uh, my dad was, a, was a, a painter, an artist, my mom was a teacher. And my dad would always say, when you can't talk about something, paint it. And being an actor, I, I used that tool uh, when I was at Juilliard studying acting. I started trying to connect with, with the characters emotionally by using paint as a medium of expression, not as an illustration of something, but actually as a, a direct connection to the, to the energy, to the vitality, because I was looking for character. And I realized that over the years that my professional life as an actor created in me a highly protective side about my uh, life as, as an artist, as a, really as a, uh, what would become a visual philosopher. But when I was doing the television show Dallas um, in the um, early 80s, Carla, my wife, and I moved here to our home that we live in now. And I realized that that success in one uh, creative life or what was called success led to the realization that many of the questions I needed to ask, uh, many of the conversations I needed to have, I couldn't look to my professional life. I couldn't look to the life of an actor for that type of nourishment. So I began uh, opening my home and I've done so now for the last 41 years to weekly discussion groups. And I had a 25 year theosophical discussion group and to balance that by looking at Western inner tradition and uh, really spending uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays looking at everything from uh, alchemy and, and Carl Jung to uh, Blavatsky and theosophy to the Hermetic and ancient teachings. Because I'd always felt that we had inherited this great treasure from our ancestors. And it wasn't given to us. We had to show interest in it. And so uh, I didn't start out with a grand conceit that I would do something. I just kept attending this other garden. Um, and my life as an actor allowed me to, um, in a way, live without having to turn my art into a way to make money. So I could use it as simply a way to ask questions. And over the years, it became, as the discussion groups became, in a way, it grew to become, become the greater real. And you'd said about about 9-11 uh, and that remarkable uh, uh, trauma and, and tragedy and what it triggered is that for me, um, uh, that that event triggered what began my work on my studio my called The Hieroglyph of the Human Soul. And I really feel that that's what my life was uh, working up toward, meaning that the actor in me freed me to have what we call suspension of disbelief, not over identifying with archetype, but to actually be able to journey, to embody. And I had done this with my tarot revision, um, which I had spent 17 years on. And I had uh, published that right around the turn of the century, uh, right before the collapse or not published that was but but there was a type of emergence of this one work which was on the archetypes and the mythic structure of the psyche and then there was the 9 11 uh the collapse of the 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 towers and the, in that collapse then that triggered this other work this uh, hieroglyph the human soul in my studio and um so i so if, to make a long long winded answer to who am i or what am i really feel that 
what I've come to embody is to a great degree the relationship with the creative spirit and in a time where art is not valued where things are in a way always looked at from the accountants of the imagination where's your audience where's the bottom line that this work of mine led me back home it led me back to become a gardener of the soul meaning that if we're going to ask these essential questions that adam and you and i talk about a lot we have to figure out where we can do that and how we can honor these things and so my life and my art is an expression of a devotion to saying at least here let this matter I'm not going to make my argument with you about it doesn't matter to you. If it doesn't matter to you, that's fine with me. But that will not be my conversation. I'm like a gardener. If you want to talk about these things, let's talk. Let's inspire each other. We do not need to critique each other. We do this for ourselves. So the question is, how do we gather? How do we remind each other that it's always the quality of the stories we tell ourselves, both inwardly and outwardly, that change the world? It's never knowing who to blame or who's at fault that changes anything. Well, thank you for that, Lee. And you know, I have so many fond memories of time in, in the studio, in the library, and just being in the presence of others. And you as a convener of these discussions. And it really invites, I think, m many of us to convene, that is this not a time of, of convening, of coming together, not as you pointed out in right or wrong or, it, or acrimony and all the world and its chaos and conflict and all of that, but to convene in a place of, of discussion and exploration where we can begin to reimagine and dream and explore the, the the ancient wisdom and the perennial philosophies of our time. This is an invitation, I believe, for any of us and all of us. And that conversation, of course, begins with two of us. Although I do have to admit, I often have conversations with myself, <laughs> to be honest with you. But <laughs> the point being is it's such a great invitation at this time. And, and, and notwithstanding all the interviews that I've been doing, Lee, very consistently, I hear from the guest that um, they're excited and they're grateful for the conversation. Not anything particular of a topical piece of the conversation, but just to be in the conversation. And this is the invitation for us, all of us today, because that is what creates a great impulse of creation, a great impulse of movement, whether you are an artist of on a, on a canvas or an artist of consciousness, or you're an artist in your leadership, or we're artist as a mother, as a father, it is all honored in the conversation. And this is the great invitation of our time. So thank you for doing so. And thank you for presencing that today uh, for this conversation. And I, and I'd like to move into looking at a short video clip that invites all of us into a, a conversation. And I believe that this video and these videos that will follow subsequently are an invitation for all of us. And I, I know it is for me to be open, to sit and be present for what may not have you've ever heard or felt or seen, but to really come into that place of the imaginative, where you too can become part of this great journey in your own unique way, in your own genius to, to become part of that, because we all certainly belong. So let's take a look at this first piece where we'll explore the great mother. We'll explore Sophia and so much more. There's a conversation going on about the reemergence of Sophia. Of course, from her point of view, it's not a reemergence, it's a new awareness of Sophia. 
And I am delighted to participate in this conversation because what I'm going to talk about today is not the outcome of something I made up, belief I have, but actually a revelation that's come through art itself from the creative process of the not most. And what Sophia teaches, and this is the emergence of Sophia, in a story called The Hieroglyph of the Human Soul, which is my home, but it also began on 9-11-2001 when the towers came down in the book. And I realized that what this has been expressing now for 21 years is this journey back to the cave, back to the truth that we're the technology, that we're the outcome of a great question, what does it mean to be human? And to perceive this level of our story, we really do have to talk to the mother. Mm -hmm. Because she says, I'm the mother of generation. I'm the knowledge of your atoms. There are no evil atoms. If you don't like your stories, tell better stories. Begin with the story you're telling about who and what you think you are. And don't begin with a story about what's wrong with your neighbor, but with a story you should tell those you love about why being human matters. Why it's a noble adventure, no matter how difficult or painful. Because the other part here is when a library. And she says, to know yourself is not to know yourself in time, but to know yourself in humanity. Yes. To see that in every book, in every age, in every culture, the same questions are asked. How do we do? How do we wake up in the morning? How do we deal with the despair? What do we do with the loss? And that's why, for me, a great passion almost about mm. that question on 9-11, the collapse of the Twin Towers. And I started to realize symbolically, because this has to do with my work in the Tarot Revision and my world archetype, interestingly enough, dated 15 years to the day of 9-11-1986. And so in the collapse here, we fell back to the floor. It was like Michelangelo shouting with God and hope, falling off the scaffolding of the ego. And saying in the ordinary home, on Linoli, what do we tell our kids? We're being brought to our knees. And she says, now that you're on your knees, let me tell you a story. And that's why I didn't know this would be so deep, and I didn't have any intentionality as to what the story would be. But as I began the process, a language known as the watcher language, which I liken to a type of fractal language of entity, meaning that we talk about stream theory and physics, but what we forget is sentience. And then everything here is actually about Sophia, because we must remember that Sophia is wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the chalice. This is a reoccurring theme here as well, which is that we are held within the chalice of all ideas. And we can see here the infant in the chalice over the spines of the books of religion says that our adventure is that we are willing to be born into these questions, to never know, but to always return with a book of life that has been lived, that's added to the story. This is why Sophia reminds us and as her story grew, a flower began to emerge on her heart. And she said that remember that a flower is the outcome of a journey. It's not that any part of the journey is to destroy the blossom, but finally in the blossom, we realize that it's no one of us, but each of us held together with a greater beauty. That's why this house, this home, Olandar, is on ancient Shumash, sacred land. And the conversation with the ancestors here is extraordinary because I became a cave painter. I think I'm probably the last of the cave painters. The technology is only the human imagination, breath, paint, and storytelling. And that's why it's not the hubris of the scaffolding. I need more. I need to be higher. I need to be better. But what do I do now that we've crashed in here? And she says, when you realize that the blossom is something mighty, but it's also something tender, then possibly the real question now is how do we find our way home? How can we be intimate with the things we know? 
how can we turn once again to see this story of the greater alchemy of birth and life? We can start to see how her belly even is the face of the child. And she will remind us now. She says, I'm the great mother. And in my address of my crown, we begin to see that it's the forming of the serpent, serpent energy, the great kundalini, meaning the arising of the electromagnetic entity of sentience itself, the theological form. And as she holds this, it opens its mouth, and we'll see the mother and the father. Now, the father is holding this Ouroboros, the story of infinity and time and condition and form. And we think of father, pattern, potter, pattern. Father holding the patterns, and the mother, and there's an ark in front of her womb. And she says, I remind you that you travel universes through wounds, not with machines. But it takes you 100 million years to get to the nearest star. Your math is all off. She's in a hologram. There's no there, there in a hologram. And that's why, when we think of a time machine, that's a library. It holds all our different times, our civilizations, our sense of who and what we are, but in a way that we can enter in but not be swept away. And that's important here because she says, now that you can live with me, because I do, I can reveal things that I cannot reveal if you are shouting or angry. And this is, again, the story of coming back into intimacy and a greater sense of wonder. And so Sophia became, and the story of the great mother becomes, in this evolving painted cave, the story of the first principle, life. She says, you begin with math. You begin with time and separation and the sense that you have to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. She says, begin with love, with capital L. I love, therefore I am. Now, your father teaches you, I think, therefore you, I am. These are very important because you're born of a mother and a father. That's what is expressed here. Mm. We'll have the mother and we'll also have the father. And the father actually stands at the nexus of the heart, like the two hemispheres of the brain, and says, when you think, you separate. Because thinking involves I am this and not that. So that journey will take us into the journey of self-reflection and the development of our ego. But the mother will be, I love, therefore I am. And in love, we see the unity. We see the connection with all things. And that's why this is my home. This is my home. But each individual, where they live, when they love, they find that sense of home. These things must matter on that level. And that's why we can even see this story told over and over again here, that part of our beauty Part of our blossom was that, going back to our mythology, but the point was, in all of these different stories, that the God force could not manifest in time. It would dissolve the structure itself. So it was, how do we deal with layers and membranes so that we're building up layer after layer, qualities that can finally hold, and we think of the DNA, this is what we have. We're woven of this story now. And that's what this painting starts to say. That the great genius here is that this innocence, this ancientness, cannot enter into these unique worlds, but is dreaming them into being, and as if on gossamer, that to interrupt them would be to destroy them. So that we are essentially being thought into a greater story that rises now from the dark building itself finally to realize the story of the light and the vision of the eyes that across the ages has taken this journey into the question of, again, how do we bring together the father and the mother? How do we bring together love and thought? When I think I separate, when I love, I connect. What's beautiful here, it will say that now you are that magnificent. And one can see as anyone stands here, that we are on her belly. So we're growing out of this great question. And it allows us to finally say, we are that blossom. It's time to find our way home to remember, not simply, I think therefore I am, but to finally realize I love their wine.
And this is the list of this. Yeah. Yeah, well, wonderful, wonderful, Lee. There's so much to explore there. And I, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to feel the invitation that, that, that she's offered and that you are expressing in Sophia, in that journey to the womb and into that place of that I, I, I felt the invitation, and, and this is what I am sensing, and perhaps many of you are sensing, is there something that is inviting you to come home? And, you know, not so much, I think, therefore, I am, what is it, but to know that it is a presence of love that is inviting each of us to, to take that journey home. And the the intimacy I know in my own personal journey, um, that journey to, to intimacy, to that inner relationship of inner being back to that womb was one that often invoked a sense of fear in the unknown. And it was an invitation, although at times I didn't know to trust this journey home. And Perhaps you can share more with us about this journey and what that can, how each of us can engage in that, how she's inviting us into this place of, I love, therefore I am. And, and Well, I think one of the, the questions that, that we need to ask and often don't is where can we ask these questions of intimacy? Where do we feel safe? And I realized that a lot of the, the metaphor, like with art, when we think about art, well, where was it created? Why was it created? Who was it created for? Tells us a lot about the deeper informing nature of the art itself. And I think it's very important to remember this. And it's one of my, my fine talking points at this point, which is, is, is the domestic key, meaning that the last place that we can actually close the door and say, well, at least to me, this is essential. This matters. <laughs> where we where we live. And, and, I, and I think this is very um, uh, significant because essentially the key is that, that we transform our story by essentially resetting where we place the story and what value we place on the story. And part of my work and part of what the hieroglyph, a lot of this is about, is that over the Piscean age, over this vast period of time, we've really been trained by trauma and other uh, conditioning to stand adjacent to our own participation in the story, to undervalue it, to think, oh, well, I'm, I have no relevance to this, this conversation. And I do believe that that's why, in my work, that the archetypes uh, reassert themselves in a place where, as community, we've gathered for all these years and amongst ourselves said, well, at least here we'll honor that this matters to us. So along come the archetypes that are born of this environment here, where there's individuals, and then, of course, uh, myself, where this this sense of of maybe the things that don't matter in the world still matter and maybe that if we see that they don't matter in the world it's because it's upon ourselves to answer the call of well maybe i'm that part of the missing uh, story and so that the archetypes uh, emerging here at my home Olandar and then the hieroglyph of the human soul also emerging within the context of home I think is very telling because if you think about the movie E.T. or the movie Wizard of Oz you, you could argue that the human soul wants to find its way home do you know and that we've become so deeply damaged so traumatized with a sense of unworthiness that even if we found our way home we wouldn't feel worthy of being at home and i think that's why as i said in the the video clip 
that what I saw here was a relationship of Michelangelo on the scaffolding in the Sistine Chapel and our conversations in those days and the sense of self, the development of a 16-foot David. You know, in other words, everything's enormous. Our, our sense of self is vaulted. It's, 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 it's reaching for the ceiling, so to speak. And this developed our sense of, of unique uh, personality, unique ego, unique capacity. But I really see in this mythic arc that what happened here and what happened collectively is when the binary, when the twin brothers of the Piscean age, the false erections of money and God, or I have more than you do, and I have the right to shout at God, my ideas make me uh, no longer responsible to that which is um, on the ground, like the Tower of Babel come collapsing back down and we have to reconfigure ourselves we have to rethink and that i started on my knees here i spent three and a half years on the floor literally in a looking down and i thought and this is a child position this is like always looking not away not not against but i was looking down and it started to shift my perception into what i almost call a type of tree-like perception that i wasn't looking to the past or the future but i was looking to roots i was looking to that greater depth and because of that and because of this watcher language this 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 flow that had emerged through my pen but also i'm convinced it emerged through the appropriate context think of certain secrets in the human story that says without the appropriate context i cannot reveal yeah. and the stories i want you to know now have to do with where you live they have to do with your heart. They have to do with putting you back in the picture. They have to do with you saying, if the conversation is not in the world, maybe then I will convene. I will create space for that conversation. Maybe I am a custodian of the things that I say the world might be lacking. Well, maybe I'm showing up saying, I'm to add to not the story of what's lacking, but to add to, let me add this as well. And I really believe again on a profound level that the reason this is my home the reason the hieroglyph of the human soul the reason the archetypes of tarot revision the codex tor the mandalas everything that's happened here which is astounding has been private is because this is where i truly believe the missing key to our humanity lies that the answer to self-knowledge is not in time it's in humanity and it's in a context that allows us to tell a story and this is why it's my home that says i'm not in this alone when i'm at home i'm in this with my family i'm in this with the people i love so my conversation isn't about my enlightenment who cares about that what i care about is the story that i am responsible not simply to my storyline but to the greater play of the human theater and i think that's really what this has been about which is the last key was how do we find our way home? And when we do, we look around and we realize that our home has an above, a below, and an in between, or structure, imagination, and responsibility. And in, in that beautiful invitation, um, you know, some, something I think that perhaps is emerging, and maybe you'll have a few thoughts on this, is and I kind of felt it in your pulse and vibration uh, with this invitation on this journey home. I love, therefore I am. And of course, that's not mutually exclusive as I think, therefore I am. That's not the point, thinking or loving, because of course it's both. That's the richness and treasure of the depth of our humanity. And it, it takes me back to something I've been exploring for the past two decades in my research and journey and experience in the shamanic path, the path of the Pachimama, the, 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 the mother, the great mother of earth and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the interconnectivity with the, with the cosmos and the interconnectivity with the quantum field. And, you know, we perhaps will get more into that today, but I sense that this is a piece, what I hear from you and I, and I want to open this up to everybody tuning in right now is herein lies perhaps a great secret of our time 
And that that secret doesn't reside anywhere other than ourselves. It resides right here in our heart, in the human soul, in the human capacity to dream. And that is this invocation to share your story. Because in every way, what we're finding is it's not simply the return of the earth keepers and the wisdom keepers. It's the return of the storyteller within. And that invitation to find your way through story, through creativity, through art, through imagination, through maybe it's just simple silliness and magic of being alive and being the child that's alive within you. So it doesn't matter what it is, but it's what matters and what I'm hearing and what I'm inspired with from what you shared, Lee, is that here we are to share and convene and share that story together. And this great journey of the hieroglyph of the soul is something that I'm listening to. And I hope many others are feeling the reemergence of that place within the womb of your being, the womb of your light, the place that now begins to share itself and yourself and your genius in the world. Do you have any thoughts on, on any of that before we turn to another another video? Yeah, I, I feel that it is that to remember, and I think this is one of the the damages that's been done with our direct relationship to the creative spirit by what I call the accountants of the imagination. And they're not simply outside of ourselves, they're inside of ourselves too, which are, where's your audience? Where are your demographics? What's the point? Why are you writing this? No one's going to listen. No one cares. No one cares about poetry. Why do you care? If we begin to say, thank you very much for that data download, I really didn't need, but I appreciate it anyway, because it's it, it comes flooding into the human being. It's not personal. It's just, in a sense, the voice of resistance. And I realized that part of my rebellion, so to speak, of making my work my home was the sense of, I will make my first relationship with the creative spirit. I will be devoted to this conversation. And if someone else hears it, or if it's shareable at some point, that will be great. But I realized that the child within us runs out thinking, this is wonderful. I want to share it with you to a world that is silent or even resentful. Like, shut up. I'm not interested in these things. And it's that, oh, well, this must not be interesting. And I realize that part of the maturation going on now with our psyches is this sense of, well, then I will take responsibility for the first uh, relationship will be with the creative spirit. So if I do write a poem, I won't wait for three or four people to go, my, that was a good poem, or in a sense, wait for the authentication of something outside. I'll go out into nature. I'll sit with the flowers and the birds, and I'll read the poem there, because in a way, that is what the poem was for, which is the rapport, the relationship with the beloved, with the creative spirit. I think we have to reclaim that consciously as storytellers, that I wrote this for you, not for them. I wrote this between us like we would with a lover. This is our time. And this is what I've, I've really experienced directly with the rapport of a lot of the work I've done, a lot of the art I've done, which is this is our time together. You're not creating an illustration of something. You're not creating a picture for others to see. A picture will be the final product, essentially. It'll be the final image that is the outcome of all of this time of exploration. The others will see the finished image. But for you and me, this will be our time together. And I believe that in resetting that, giving ourselves permission for that, we take away this messiah complex need to part the red seas to think we're having a spiritual event we go back to as children truly picking up a wildflower and being able to see infinity eternity because our wonder is restored because as we know a sense of wonder opens universes a loss of a sense of wonder closes them down this is our time together and and you know what a joy 
to be in this walk with with all all of you and the extraordinary beauty that surrounds us. And although we can tune our lens to all other kinds of things, but I think when we do turn to to return to that wonder, which is in so many ways is alive in all of us, is it not? It may just be hidden or maybe it's in sheath in the journeys of our own human trauma and all that that every single one of us goes through. So this is a great invitation to return into that place of, of, of story because as Lee and, and I are sharing here, it, it matters. And it, it, it perhaps is not so much of what we leave behind in our lives path, but perhaps it's the new stories that we tell and we give forward to our children and their children. So we get to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lee J. McClowski. Thank you for inviting us all to, to take that journey together home. Uh, we are so longing to belong, and we do belong. It's simply a, an idea that we don't. And it's wonderful to come back to that place of our garden so that we can be the gardeners uh, of, our, of our life, so we can plant those seeds, that corn that will help us well, dream our lives into being, to reimagine and bring into a greater place of presence, of oneness, of love, our connection with each other, to bring home the compassion and the kindness and the love of who we are in connection with the Mother Earth. So thank you so much for sharing your light, your genius, your wisdom, and, and all of it. And I so look forward to continuing our, our conversation and... Uh, I do have one last question for you, though. Right. What is your cure for terminal seriousness? <laughs> oh, oh, actually, that was in uh, in Mothership when I was painting the, her story of revelations in pink. And I love it because if there's one line that sums it up, uh, it's not enlightenment. It's in lighten up, breathe, <laughs> laugh. Tell a story you could live with. Stop taking yourself so seriously. As consciousness would say, honey, your story's not that interesting. Take out the garbage. Get over yourself. Come on back. We'll have a conversation. But oy vey, lay off of the highfalutin. <laughs> now I know the cosmos. Maybe begin with something, as Rilke says, some word you've earned. You can't convince the angels in the cosmos with your grand emotions you're just a beginner so tell them of some word you've earned i like oh, that oh indeed indeed <laughs> indeed and to to say life is way too important to take seriously so exactly let's, yeah. have, let's, let's have some fun as we're going forward thank you very much blessings thank you, to you. be well bless you. you too thank you adam <laughs>